a big part of the whole game and, and, and a lot of what I talk about is really about speaking to the dark side, speaking to the shadow, right? That's what a lot of BDSM is. It doesn't mean that you're a dark individual necessarily. It doesn't mean you have to be a bad person. Every person has a, a shadow, right? Now, something to understand about the shadow is a certain psychology that goes around with sexuality. Living in Western society, Western civilization, and a lot of it is just, it, it permeates throughout the world, but a lot of it goes like this. There are certain things that are pushed into the subconscious, right? Pushed into the unconscious mind <clears throat> through being civilized, right? Through being trained and taught how to be a proper person within civilization. What a lot of these things do is repress sexuality. And I'm going to say something real. There's a certain aspect of sexuality that does need to be repressed. It does need to be suppressed. It does need to be controlled. But there's a time and a place for everything. Within the dark nature of sexuality, there's the submissive ego and there's the dominant ego. Right? Both of these things have a dark aspect to it. Right? The shadow. So, within the dominant ego, there's the incubus or the succubus, right? What it does is it seeks to take validation and to drain energy from an individual through the pleasure that they experience and the control that they're willing to give up, right? That's the dominant ego. Now, the control that they're willing to give up, it goes in several different directions. It can be just the, the pleasure that they're experiencing means something beyond what they can give themselves. Another aspect is for them to be willing to do something that goes outside of the narrative of what they view as, you know, uh, acceptable behavior in a normal sense. Another aspect of it is the social image and the idea of what it means to be respected or respectable agency, autonomy, all these different things. So domination is something that's typically given a bad rap. Submissiveness is something that's typically given a bad rap. But they're not inherently wrong. Right? There are bad things that can happen if your sexual desires and appetites are without temperance. Right? Without moderation. You could become a stone cold hedonist without having any moral standards or principles that control that behavior. Right? Because if everything is 100% about just what you sexually desire, then guess what? There are going to be people who are not legally of age who you may look at and view them through the lens of their sexual attraction being high but it's not moral for you to sleep with that individual so you make a conscious decision through your logical mind and say that's not what I'm going to do <clears throat> that doesn't mean that you're not attracted to that individual you could be in a relationship that's monogamous and see an individual who you're sexually attracted to but make a logical decision with your conscious mind to suppress that or to transmute that to avoid breaking the agreement of your relationship dynamic. There could be people in your family who you could look at and say, wow, this person is attractive, sexually attractive, they're sexually appealing. But you make a logical decision and say, I'm not going to do that. There could be scenarios where an individual is intoxicated, they're inebriated, right? Or a person displays resistance that shows that that's not what they want to do. Or they can tell you verbally that they're not interested in a sexual relationship with you. And if you do not control that and suppress that or walk away, then you may do that. You may find yourself in a scenario where you coerce an individual, right? All of these different things are aspects of the dark sexual shadow. 
Then there's the submissive ego, right? That submissive ego is predicated upon how appealing you find an individual and being willing to bypass your own morals, your own social image, your own ideas to give up control over your quote unquote better judgment in order to deal with them. Right. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I think it's a very important concept to understand. Like I'm somebody who is a proponent of, you know, degradation. You know, part of the dark side of the female sexuality is that a lot of women have rape fetishes, rape kinks. A lot of women don't experience an orgasm until they're being violated. Because there's something inherently within the nature of sexual dominance, of strength, of desiring someone to the point of being willing to take it that makes you feel more desired. Right? It's like you want it so much that you want it even if I don't want it. Or even if I give the impression that I want it. Now, of course, most people are well-balanced enough to say that if I don't want it, I don't want it. I don't want you to take it. But that's an aspect of it. It's like informal speech. I might have a homeboy how I call my dog. I might have another homeboy, you know, I call my nigga. Right? I might have a girl I'm dealing with, I might call her my bitch. These are all different aspects of it. Another thing is that sexual desire is something that works like being under the influence of drugs or alcohol. Your pain tolerance goes up. Your ability to make logical thought goes down. The way that you think changes. You know, a certain part of your brain shuts off when you're having an orgasm. And that's something that can create certain fixations for people. Where your desire and your pleasure is at such a high level to where you're fascinated with the ability for pain to mix with pleasure. Not only for pleasure and desire to make pain tolerable, but for that pleasure and desire to make pain mix with pleasure to the where those wires get crossed, those, those lines get crossed, those boundaries become different. And that's a big part of what BDSM is about. Now, one thing to understand about the dark side of female sexuality is the desire for a man who's dominant to the point where he does not care about her boundaries. A woman's not going to say this out loud. Most aren't. Some will, but most won't. That's not a green flag to just be some type of rapist or some shit like that. That's not what I'm saying. But there are very pertinent aspects of this to understand. Now, the incubus. What does the incubus do, right? And this is just my own definition, my own understanding of it. It's where you create this level of desire and lust within a woman to where she's willing to give up of herself. She desires you sexually. You take her to the depths and the dungeons and the dark places of her sexuality. And it becomes a drug, it's addictive. Because you're experiencing the pleasure, but a lot of life force energy is being drained out of you in the process. Like, there's reasons people say snatching the soul, right? Like your soul got snatched. It's because you're really trading pleasure for control. You're really trading pleasure for your mind, will, and emotions being captivated within that moment to where you lose control over those things. You lose control over your mind. You lose control over your will. You lose control over your emotions and those things get brought under subjection to that other person. See, that's what it means when your soul gets snatched, right? Now, keep in mind that pretty much every woman you come in contact with that's going to be somewhere within the recesses of her subconscious. 
typically it's just going to be a matter of what category she views you as based off of her attraction level to you, the level of game that you have, how you present yourself to her. There's the gentleman gigolo complex and the Madonna whore complex, right? These are the things that create this delineation because many people, if you're not exposed to this aspect of things, then you might have a more so quote unquote pure way that you relate to sexuality, but most people aren't in that position. You have your social image and the way that you believe that you're supposed to interact with the person sexually and otherwise, that is supposed to be under the context of the utmost respect, of respecting all boundaries, right? Of not doing anything that you didn't purpose to do before you met the individual or before you engaged in that interaction. And the desire not to lose this control can lead to anxiety at times. Just an important concepts to understand. But when, let's say, a woman views you as more so a, a gentleman, then you're interacting with her under the context that you will respect all of those boundaries, that you will not try to push her past her limits or take her to a place where she is going to uh, expose a side of herself that she doesn't believe that you can handle seeing. Oftentimes for the gigolo, it's cool. But typically this meant to be like letting air out of a tire when it gets hot outside. She gets hot, she might wanna let a little bit of steam off, let a little bit of pressure off, let her inhibitions down a little bit for a finite period of time so that she then has more of an ability to sustain and maintain that image, the social image, how she views herself. And she would typically like that to be a man who she's not going to interact with uh, over an extended period of time on a daily basis with. That way she doesn't have to mix up too much how she views herself with how she's behaving in that particular interaction. Now that's where a lot of sexual integration comes in at sexual integration is about being able to have the sustainability and to also have healthy assets and aspects of a relationship while still being able to tap into that aspect of your sexual shadow integrating that understanding that that aspect of your sexuality is part of who you are as a person when you understand this it puts you in a better situation One thing that keeps a lot of men from becoming sexually integrated, right, and tapping into their sexual shadow is that within the recess of the sexual shadow of a man is this raw primal sexual desire coupled with physical and mental domination, right? And this physical and mental domination coupled with this primal sexual desire is that men who tap into their sexual shadow without having any type of integration to it oftentimes become become men who are deviants, right? There's this fear of feeling rapey, feeling like a rapist. Right? That's where a lot of the fear comes from. It's not necessarily about what someone else will do to you. At times it could be, but that's more so in the, the submissive sexual ego. With the dominant sexual ego, it's more so about the fear of abusing that power. Once you integrate, you no longer fear misusing that power because having that power is part of how you relate in the first place. So it's integrated into your mindset and how you deal with the woman. So it's not something that goes contrary to your morals, values, and principles. Right, because oftentimes people act like the concept of being digmatized doesn't exist. It definitely does. Just like a lot of men get pussy with. See, oftentimes this concept of being digmatized is when a woman is interacting with a man 
who is not integrated or she's not integrated and she gets to a place where the sexual dynamic and the dominance that she experiences causes her to give up control over her actions, her mind, will, and her emotions. Her soul gets snatched. And then from that place, she's in a state of the pleasure that she's experiencing making makes her willing to give up control in a way that sets her life off course from the direction that she's trying to go in. All right? Now, think about this. If you've ever experienced this, then to deal with the man who cannot do this for you typically is not a man who you truly feel for. Overstimulation leads to duplicity. You have to watch my video on that. Overstimulation leads to sexual duplicity. When you understand this concept, it puts you into a mind state where you understand that it's best not to go places that are further than what you are willing to integrate or able to integrate into the type of dynamic that you want to have long term on a social emotional setting. And this can work in a variety of ways. Understand the difference between the submissive and the dominant ego. Because the dominant is the primary giver of pleasure and the primary receiver of control. Much of the dark side of a female sexuality, it works in a prim- it works in a variety of ways. But oftentimes the dark side is within the duplicity. It's within the dishonesty. It's within the transactional nature of it. Where a woman may utilize her beauty and her sex appeal to extract resources from a man who otherwise would not want to give them. Right? But that's on the feminine dominant side. On the submissive side, it's that willingness to give up control. That desire to be ravished. Like once you have a high level of sexual attraction in a relationship and much of the social standards and social image go out the window, much of the ideas of what it means to be respected kind of goes out with it. Much of the idea of consent goes out with it. And it kind of turns into more of a blanket consent, a pre-consent, consensual non-consent type of relationship to where a person doesn't have to ask another person if sex is something they want to do. It's already understood. Now, one thing that alleviates this is where two people are both sexually attracted to one another. Right. When two people are both sexually attracted to one another and they are willing to open, ready, and desire to be within that dynamic. Another thing is having a high enough libido, right? To lead, to be able to be in or around that mind state of a high level of sexual desire outside of those finite moments. Because what some people are able to do is to take these moments of sexual desire and compartmentalize them into circumstances and situations where they do no longer feel that way, right? So in the moment, they may be willing to be called names or to call names, to experience aggression or to be aggressive. But then outside of that, their goal is for that relationship to carry on 100% regularly. My own personal ideology is for that to be something that permeates outside of the bedroom. But it's really fascinating to think about the psychology of what a woman typically views as respect and how that doesn't apply to a man who she has a high level of sexual desire and a natural inclination towards sexual submissive with submissiveness with the same things that another man might do that she would consider to be abusive would be the things that she desires from him the most could smack a woman pull her hair smack her ass do things without asking first 
on a sexual side. Spit in her mouth. Call her names. And if you don't do that over a period of time, when she is accustomed to liking and desiring these things from you, then she will feel unsatisfied because you aren't utilizing and taking advantage of that level of submissiveness she has towards you. But for a man who she views more as the gentleman archetype, as a man who she is attracted to through her social mask and her social image, if he were to do these particular things, she wouldn't be deep enough into a state of sexual desire and attraction to be able to handle and experience and enjoy these things without such a level of cognitive dissonance within her leading to feeling like these actions are inherently abusive until she's experienced it. Many women don't know the difference between feeling that certain things are inherently wrong versus understanding that certain things just feel wrong because of the level of attraction that you have for an individual. You know, and there's a dark side of female sexuality, too, because most people, the, and especially in Western society, the way you're going to interact in a relationship is going to be either monogamous or something close to it. Duplicity is a thing. If you fuck every person that you ever come across, you might be in a bad spot. STDs, there's ways to mitigate it, but none of them are 100%. What else is there? You know, there's pregnancies you don't want to have. There's overstimulation, which is the main one that people... I think a lot of men, when it comes to the concept of overstimulation, they feel too insecure to say that that's what it is or to be able to articulate it because their ego feels too triggered. Yes, it doesn't always that work that way, but for certain women, right? And for a lot of women, if she experiences a much larger dick than you have and she enjoys that on a high level, then that largeness of that penis, one, it's going to be aesthetically pleasing to her. But then on another note, it's going to be something that stretches her in a way where if you are unable to provide that same mixture of pain and pleasure or hit those same spots or have that same ease of pleasure that you give her through the ability to stretch her in that way and she experiences a high level of pleasure from that, then she will not view you in that same way. That's something that can't happen. I've been on both sides of it. I understand how that shit works. And you can also overcome it. It doesn't have to always be a size thing. But, you know, that's just how it works. It's not necessarily the number of partners. It's more so how far you go with those individual people. Like, if your purely sexual relationships don't go uh, if your purely sexual relationships go much further sexually than your integrated relationships then it can cause your integrated relationships to not be integrated but to be a social relationship that is more so just based off of the social interaction and the emotional interaction but it doesn't even fully hit the emotional interaction in the same way because you're only showing a person one facet of who you are and that can lead to you know to duplicity because eventually you're still going to want to tap into that aspect of yourself. It's part of human nature. But when we're just looking at this concept, this topic of sexual integration, sexual duplicity, the dark side uh, of psychology, the incubus, the succubus, they're all different things. Like a woman can use sex to drain a man emotionally. Right? to drain his resources, to take a man who lacks boundaries and to use the pleasure that she's given this man or the desire that he feels desired in a way he's not used to, to put him in an emotional position to where he's willing to give up control in order to maintain that desire. And if it's an insatiable desire that doesn't have true boundaries or goals to it, then a person can become submissive to an individual who does not have leadership skills. And that's where I call it the feminine dominant. The masculine dominant understands temperance, 
but the masculine dominance dominant also understands leadership skills forward movement and being able to integrate but there's a lot of different things that go along with this but it's just coach brody on the dark psychology of sexuality i'm out